necessary through his people. And God could have just provided what he wanted for the tabernacle's building. And yet he used God's people and their giving. And uh, we dealt with that. Now, I want you to begin reading with me in verse number 30 as we continue our study of ownership. And today's message just ties right in with that, that God has a purpose and a plan for you specifically, individually. Sometimes we come in a great crowd like this and we say, well, corporately God has a plan. Well, individually God has a plan. And God has wired you and prepared you for a specific purpose. Purpose, And so I want you to see that this morning. Exodus chapter number 35, begin reading in verse number 30. And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. He hath filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. To devise curious works, to work in gold and silver and in brass, in the cutting of stones, to set them, and in carving of wood, to make any manner of cunning work. And he has put in his heart that he may teach both he and Ahiliab, the son of Ahishmach, of the tribe of Dan. Them hath he filled with wisdom, of heart to work, of all manner of work, of the engraver, and of the cunning workman, and of the embroiderer, in blue and purple and scarlet. And in fine linen, and of the weaver, even of them that do any work, and of those that devise cunning work. Now, I want you to go back to verse 30. I want you to look at a little phrase there that jumped off the page at me. I read this several times. And again, when you preach through a book of the Bible like Exodus, you come to passage and you're like, well, what do you have here, Lord? And you had to, you had to kind of read it through a couple of times when the Lord pointed out this little phrase to me that just kind of grabbed my attention. And I thought, man, that's such a good phrase. I skipped it, didn't see it, but it's right there in the middle of the verse. Moses said unto the children of Israel, see the Lord hath, now what's the next phrase? Called by name. The Lord hath called by name Bezalel. I want to preach to you this morning on that simple little phrase, called by name. Now, do not do disservice to the Scripture. Do not ever take away or add to. But I do want you to personalize. I do want you to personalize. So can we read it together? And uh, when, I, when I get to the place, I'm going to point to you, and you're just going to put your name in there, okay? So let's read it now. And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name. Say, say it again. The Lord hath called by name. Let me practice with you. The Lord hath called by name Brent. Brent. You know what, Doc, I call you Doc, and I know what your mama calls you, so I can't say either one of those. So, The Lord hath called by name Monroe. The Lord hath called by, by name Ira. The Lord hath called by name John Allen. The Lord hath called by name every one of you can put your name there because the Lord did not create you. He did not bring you into this earth to live without having a purpose and plan for you. You have giftings, you have talents, you have abilities, and they are all, as uh, Nick said a few moments ago, they are to be all used for one reason and one reason only, and that is the glory of God. God hath called you by name. You say, preacher, I'm not Bezalel. No, but you're you. And you may not have Bezalel's gifts and talents, but you have your gifts and talents. I remember years ago reading a book, one of those books that kind of watershed moment, really transitional, uh, transformational in my life. And uh, in the book, the, the author said this, you know, everybody is good at something, and in every area, you're good to the point that that's your spot. Like, everybody's good at something. Well, preacher, I don't have any gifts and talents. That is a lie. That's a lie. Everybody has a gift or talent. I have a lady in mind. Her name is Carol Rooley. Carol Rooley is, uh, she's a member of our church in Texas and our dear friend. Carol Rooley probably was the most selfless servant I've ever been around. And she found working with uh, the senior saints was her calling. And I mean, when I say senior saint activity, every activity was a 10. 
She didn't have to do anything. If they're going to have a potluck, it was the best potluck you ever saw. If they're going to have an outing or an event, I mean, she was a, a, a caterer by trade. And, and, I mean, she just went over the top. And I remember watching her serve those senior citizens. And I thought, you know what? She has the gift of service. Your husband and your, my dear friend, Dick Dory, he had the gift of encouragement. I, I don't know if, if, if in the Bible you could put somebody's face next to a name uh, next to Barnabas, the encourager, I would see Dory's face. That's my preacher. I'd walk in a room. He'd holler, that's my preacher. I prayed for you today. I love you. That was a gift of encouragement. You say, what else could he do? I don't know, but I know he was great at that. Some of you can sing and play the piano. Some of you can and do the, the works with your hands like a bezalel. Others of you can teach. I said in Sunday school this morning, listen, I, I was meditating on some things this week, and, and uh, we were talking, I think my son Quinn and I were talking, and we were talking last week about just the church and, and the leadership in the church. And <coughs> we're talking about how few, <coughs> how few leaders there are in life. Most people are followers by nature. And, and here's the thing. If you're a leader, but you don't lead, you're failing. So I'm a good follower. God didn't design you to be a follower. He, he designed you to be a leader. And if you're a leader, well, I, you know, I don't want the responsibility. I, I don't want the pressure. Then you're not doing what God called you because there are few leaders that God gifts with the ability to lead. A lot of followers, but few leaders. And so this morning, I want you to think about, has God called me? The answer to that is what? Yes. By name, absolutely. And then I want you to add this thought, has God called me and what has God called me to do? Let me give you a simple three thoughts this morning. Just three truths that I meditated on this week. And the Lord seemed to make very clear to me. Number one, there was a specific calling. I think there's a general calling for everybody. The general calling is for all to be saved. That everyone should come to repentance. God wants you to go to heaven. God made it possible for you to go to heaven. There's a general calling to salvation. There's a general calling to glorify God. Those are general callings that all of us share. There's a general calling to be a witness for Christ. Everyone is to glorify Christ. Everyone is to be a witness for Christ. Those are general callings. If you are a believer in Christ, you are called to glorify Christ and to be a witness for Christ to a lost and dying world. But in that general calling, there are specific callings that only you are wired to accomplish or to do. Now, let me give you just a couple of things, really by way of introduction. Number one, I want you to think about this, and I want you to know this. God knows you personally. God knows you personally. Eight and a half billion climbing to nine. When I first started preaching, there were six billion, five and a half climbing to six, six and a half climbing to seven. Now eight and a half climbing to nine billion people on this planet right now. But you know that God knows you personally and God has known you from the moment of your conception. In fact, God has known you before your conception. Jeremiah was in the womb and the Lord knew him. John the Baptist was in the womb and the Lord knew him. I, I, I say that and to me, that's not a great point. Because I was taught early in life, the Lord knows you and the Lord loves you. But as I minister to people, I find out that there's so many in the world that do not believe that God loves them. Life hasn't been good to them. People around them have disappointed them. People around them have been uh, their whole life hurting them, uh, neglecting them, abandoning them, abusing them. And they don't know there's a God in heaven that loves them. For God so loved the world. Change that again. Personalize that again. For God so loved Brent Stansel. I matter to God. You're not a pile of junk. You're not a, a, a cosmic accident. You're not a, a goo that evolved into a something. You are a, a someone that God knows, and you are someone that God loves. You are precious, number two. Your life matters. Not only does God know you personally, but you are precious to him. Again, 
That's not a big deal to me. My mom and dad, they showed me love. My mom and dad told me from, from before I could even understand what they were saying that God loved me. And, and I, I knew that from early in my life. But there are so many people that we talk to that do not believe that anybody's capable of love. And, and witnessing to them is challenging. Because if you didn't get love from your mom, if you didn't get love from your dad, if you didn't get love from those around you, it's hard to explain the love of God. That's why the home, and again, so many things point back to the home and the beginning of your life. But God loves you. You are precious to him. Say, preacher, God died for the whole world. Mark this down. God died for you. And if you would have been the whole world, God would have died for you still. God knows you. You're not just going to skate through this thing without knowing that God knows who you are. You're precious. He loves you. But this morning, we're going to focus on this, number three. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. God has gifted you and given you talents, and everybody's good at something. And your gifts and talents only reach their highest level when they are used in service and consecrated to God. I marvel at ability. I do sometimes. I'll watch a performer and, and just, they, they've got this thing on the reels now where they isolate vocal tracks. And I've heard a song a thousand times, but they'll isolate the vocal tracks. And I'm like, Oh, my word. That is incredible. That, that ability to, to hit those notes and to, and to change and to do, oh, my word, I just envy that. I don't have that ability. I, I, I marvel at someone that can sit down and, and play the piano, or I marvel at someone that can craft something. And I'm like, wow, <clears throat> those people have great gifts and talents. But, 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 but don't miss this. Gifts and talents that are not dedicated to God will never reach their highest and fullest potential. I've been doing a lot of reading lately on, on history and, and how the Bible affected and changed your world. The great artist of the past, the great uh, discoveries in science and, and the great pushes in, in all of the arts and all of the things that we look back on and say, wow, they were all because men said there is a God and because there is a God, we want to know his creation. So the scientific pushes and then the arts and all the things that we see in literature. It, many of them were men. And they may not, may not have been born again believers, but they recognized there's a God. And because of that, we describe his beauty. Uh, the great artists and the great scientists and the great movers and shakers of the past, it was because they recognized who God was. And their gifts and talents were used to explore God's universe. Everybody saw the apple fall, but only Newton wanted to find out why the apple fell. Because he knew there was a God who had order and structure. And I could go down the list over and over and over of the great musical pieces. And you read the author, you read the composer, and you find out that it was his dedication to God that drove him to write such beauty and such majesty in music. God has a plan for you. You're precious to him. God is very personal if you allow him to be. Bezalel, I got a job for you. Again, make it personal. John, I have a job for you. Nikki, I've wired you and I have a responsibility given only to you. Nobody else can do your job. Number one, the specific calling. Number two, uh, everybody's wired and gifted. Their special credentials. This job required someone who could do the job. Worst thing in the world, work for somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. If any staff member here says amen, you're fired. Worst thing in the world. I was in the Air Force. By the way, honored to be in the military. Thankful to, to have military service. Taught me some great lessons about the world, myself, and others. I love the fact that I, I have a heritage of a military family. I 
bless my time in the Air Force. But I also recognize that there are a lot of guys in the Air Force that, uh, let's just say, not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Not the brightest bulb in the box. But they were over me because of time and service, time and grade, and they had rank, and I didn't, and, and they were the bosses. And I remember thinking, man, I don't want to work for these guys long because they don't have the skill set necessary to get the job done. In this case, God had a big job. God had a special, specific job, and he needed men. He needed people that were qualified. And so what does God do? God qualifies those he calls. You say, preacher, God's called me to do this. I don't know if I can do it. God always qualifies those he calls. And you may not have the giftings and talents at this point in your life, but God will develop them and grow you and give you those things you need to do the job. And in this case, uh, Bezalel, he had special credentials. Notice first and foremost there, verse number one, he was filled with the spirit of God. I, I, I can't begin to give you the practical part of that until I give you the theological part of that. Again, dedicated himself to the Lord. I love in the New Testament, every time you read about the men that God would use, whether it be the first deacons in Acts or Paul, Barnabas, Silas, whoever it may be, they were men that were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with God. They had dedicated themselves, Lord, use me in whatever way you see fit. God, I am yours to be used any way you choose. But then there were some practical things. First and foremost, filled with the Spirit of God. But then the Bible says, in wisdom. In wisdom, this, mark a note here if you're taking notes. Wisdom is the, the biblical term. But I want you to notice how that applies to the work God called them to. <clears throat> this the scholars and writers speak of is the power of original conception. The power of original conception. This is, we've got to build this and God's given us the overview and the outline, he gives us what he wants, but how do we take what God wants and, and make it happen? How many of you ladies are like my wife and you, you made this statement, I know what I want, but I don't know how to get there. We'll call Kirsten, Kirsten Stephanie over here, she's very good with stuff, and I would say, I've seen this and I want to get from A to B, I'm just not sure how to get there. And then you talk to somebody and they're like, Oh, do it this way. Ryan off here. Now listen, I'm glad he's in junior church today because I have to brag on him. And I don't like that. But Ryan has the power of original conception. He has the wisdom. I said, Ryan, I want a building that's multi-purpose. I want a building that we can use seven days a week. I want a building that is ex uh, not expensive to build. I want a building that still looks nice. I want it to be something that you go, wow, that's nice, but yet it still stands up to the test of time and and uh, Ryan, I don't know how to get there. He said, let's work on it. God gave him the, the wisdom. There's some guys that look at a problem and say, I, I see the problem. I just don't know how to fix it. There's some guys that have wisdom. Hey, I can navigate that. I can, I can develop that. I can take nothing and make something of that. Uh, Bezalel, here's all the tools. Here's all the things you'll need. Here's what God said. Uh, make it happen. By the way, Moses wasn't this guy. Moses has other responsibilities. I've often said uh, that I'll do what I can do, but you've got to do what you can do. God did not give Moses all the gifts. He gave Moses the leadership gift, but he gave Bezalel wisdom to do what needs to be done. This is the power of original conception. Number two, he gave not only wisdom, but understanding. Understanding. This is the power of appreciation. To see the work of others and to estimate whether it is right or not. Whether it is acceptable or not. This power is needed in master craftsmen to qualify them for passing judgment on the work produced by those under their direction. Now these two work well together, right? The first is the, is the man that says, hey, let's design this and let's build this. But then there's understanding necessarily the guys we're going to bring in to do the work. Are they doing the work? There's some guys we brought in and they were master craftsmen, but they were what we would call, uh, they were part of the, the, the con they were contractors. They were part of, of, the, of the general contractor. They brought in contractors. 
We brought in electrical contractors. We brought in concrete contractors. We brought in paint contractors. We brought in drywall. We brought in a ton of contractors. And the contractor would check the work of the contractors to see if it was up to par, to see if it was quality standard or not. There were a couple of times we're like, hey, that's got to be redone or that's got to be fixed because it didn't meet the level. And so he gave Bezalel this wisdom. That's not just to, to take all this to, and design it, but it's also to get those people around you and, and to get them going uh, in the right direction, producing the right work. And then knowledge, number three, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. This is the power of application. The engineering part. Uh, I've learned this in, in the building program. Architects will design anything their mind thinks of. And Prad Rampersad will tell you they don't know how to build it. Prad says, they send me stuff, and I'm like, you can't do this? Yeah, but it looks good on paper. Yeah, but engineering-wise, it doesn't work. And this is the ability to take what's designed and to put it with the laws of science and understanding the application process to put it all together. Uh, hey, I want to design this where it looks like this. Yeah, but you got to have structure there and you got to have supports there and we've got to make it, yeah, it's going to look good, but we got to make it sturdy. I don't want a tabernacle that looks good and falls down. Workmanship, number four, letter D. Workmanship. This is the power of execution, working out designed effects, getting the job done. How many of you know there's dreamers and there's doers? Dreamers, oh, what we could do. Doers get it done. By the way, you need dreamers and you need doers. You know what God gave Bezalel? God gave him all the gifts necessarily, necessary to take something from an idea to an actual tabernacle. So, preacher, what are you saying here? You may be some of this, all of this, but God's gifted you. And, he's got, and, and, and what God has done is he's allowed you to have certain things uh, that from your background. Again, my military background, my business background, all of these things come into play in my ministry. And God's given me certain gifts and talents, and I am to use them here as the pastor of Community Bible Baptist Church. I'm to use them uh, to lead and, and, and to try to equip and to empower you, and I'm going to put all that together. And I need some of you who are dreamers. Preacher, we can try this. And I need some of you who are engineers. Yeah, but you can do that, but you got to sustain this. And I need some of you that put it all together. And make it happen. And together, watch this, we can build something. Together, we can accomplish something. Instead of looking at that group over there and say, well, that group, all they do is dream up stuff. Well, yeah, sometimes I wish they'd work a little bit too or put some, but you know what? If you don't have dreamers, what's the doers going to do? Everybody's important in, in our staff. Brother Ammon, how many, how many checks do we write? 25, 26 checks. That's the, that's the school daycare. We write, a, we, we have, we have a, about 150 kids right now in our ministries every day. On our staff, boy, this is funny. How many of you have been to Publix? You know what Publix is. How many know there's weird people work at Publix? How many, how many of you know there's weird people work where you work? Now, if you didn't raise your hand that there's weird people that work where you work, you're the weird person at work. Are there weird, are there weird people at Publix who work there? Are there weird people where you work? You say, oh, we, go to, we work at the church. Yeah. You worked at Publix before you worked at the church, okay, just so you know. We got all kind of personalities. We, we got people, man, some days you just think to yourself, why God? Why, why did you send me that one? In other days you're like, God, 
you sent me that one so I don't kill this one. So, Mr. Ammon will come in some days, and, 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 and Clint's got a, uh, he's got a look about him that you can just tell. And I'm like, what's going on? Ooh. And then he, so-and-so, so-and-so. Now, here's the deal. Here's what he's smart enough and I'm smart enough. Yes, a little bit crazy. You know, when I, when, you know when I preach this, you know who's looking at me and laughing the most? Teresa Alfiero. Teresa Alfiero. I'm just telling you, she knows what we're talking about right here. No, I'm just kidding. Let's just use Teresa because she's identifying herself. There are, there are things about Teresa that will make me want to kill her. She's Hispanic. She's, um, not to be stereotypical, but emotion runs high at times. Preacher, I remember years ago. I remember years ago. This is long for you. You got to fix something. And I'm like, oh, goodness. What have we done? You got it. I mean, it was, ah. And I'm like, oh, my word. And we had sent home accidentally a piece of paper from the children's ministry with a non-King James verse on it. And I, we're King James. We, we, we use the King James. And I'm like, Teresa, I'll fix it. But I mean, to, right that moment, it was death, right? Remember, do you remember that, Teresa? I do. I do. 15, 15 years ago, I remember that now. Now, I say that because, number one, I love Teresa. I love her, her family. It means the world to our church and to me personally. But do, does Teresa sometimes make me want to shoot her in the head? But watch this. Nobody, not one family in the history of our church or our school, and when I say the history of our church, the last 15 years that I've been here, has done more to invest in our church, our school. I need her, crazy and all. Here's, here's what I'm saying. She, has th- she does things with our school and our ministry that I can't do. She does things that are valuable to me, valuable to our Lord. And so what I've learned is, yeah, she's not like me. I wouldn't have done that or said that. Mr. Ammon's not like me. Mr. Courtright's not like me. Clint, uh, Clint and Nick, I, I, I swipe them all the time. I, I call Nick, Clint, and Clint, Nick. They're completely opposite. The only reason that I, I confuse them is because it's just in my mind now. But they're completely opposite. Caleb, completely opposite. Everybody's different. Every, Nicole, everybody's got a piece. But every piece of this puzzle is important and valuable. Love you, John. Love you, Sarah. Every piece is valuable. Every piece is important. And her giftings and his giftings and his gifting. We just brought on, uh, just graduated, we just brought on Colin And Colin's going to bring a whole different giftings, a whole different set of talents that we need. Rick Boswell, very different, very different. Mike Austin, Susanna Austin, goodness gracious, very different. But so vitally important, critical. I'm telling you that you are critical and your gifts and talents are valuable you say well preacher what can I do something something every person here ought to have a responsibility that is yours and yours alone that without you a ministry of our church would suffer because you're not part of it so number one I want to give you this specific calling number two their specific credentials. But I want you to notice a little, again, just reading this five, six, seven, eight, nine times, I didn't see it, didn't see it, and I was like, holy cow. Verse 34, and he put in his heart that he may, what's the next words? He put in his heart that he may teach. Now listen to my statement. It's not enough that you know who are you teaching what you know. You know what we're doing in America? We're losing generations of craftsmen. I believe we're losing a generation of Christians because somewhere along the way, 
what we know we did not transfer. So I give this third thought. Their shared commitment to the generation behind. It's one thing for you to know, but who are you teaching? I read John McC- I read John Maxwell. I almost did it again. I did it. I did it at the graduation. I said John MacArthur. I meant to say John Maxwell. I read John Maxwell a lot. John Maxwell made this statement. He said, I mentor 10 people a year specifically that I choose. They don't come to me. I look at them and I recognize characteristics about their life that are committed and faithful. And, and I think I can be of value. And I ask them for the privilege and the opportunity to, to, to mentor them. And he said, I do 10 a year. And he, and he goes back and he gives some, some of the people that he's invested over the years. What John Maxwell said was this, I know some things you don't know. And by the way, he's been mentored by others. John Wooden was John Maxwell's mentor. John Wooden, the great baseball, basketball coach at uh, uh, UCLA, was one of the mentors of John Maxwell. And he said, I pour into people what I've learned because I don't want to just know it without passing it on. And this is where a multi-generational church uh, is so important because as Titus teaches us, if our elders are not teaching our youngers, we're going to lose a vast wealth of knowledge and ability. How many of you have ever been to Washington, D.C. and seen the great cathedral there? The great cathedral. I was there on tour. This is 25, 30 years ago. I was there on tour at the cathedral, and I was talking to the stonemasons. By the way, they're still building this building. This is a continu- bu- been building for hundreds of years. And um, I said to one of the stonemasons, I said, what's the future here? He said, I don't know. I'm very worried because we do not have a generation of masons coming up that know how to do what we do. Losing that wealth of knowledge. Bezalel, it wasn't enough that he did. It wasn't enough that he knew. It was enough that he did and knew But he had to teach others what he knows so they could do. If I preach and minister only to my generation but fail to prepare the generation behind me, I have missed one of the greatest responsibilities of my life. If my kids don't know, if my family here as a church doesn't know, that's my responsibility. Let me give you a couple of things. Number one, just this understanding of a commitment that we are to commit to faithful men that they may be able to teach others also. There are some things that we must teach those who follow us. Number one, and I'm going to start with this because this is generic and anybody can do it, but we must teach craftsmanship, careers, trades, skills, things that you know how to do. You know one of the first things God gave Adam? A job. They're to dress and keep the garden. And he gave him ability. Solomon had this knowledge of horticulture and and animal husbandry, all these different things. And, And the responsibility of what you know is to teach others. Some of you men, uh, you know how to do certain things. Some of you ladies, listen, we talk about men a lot. Let me talk about ladies. Ladies, if you're not passing on what you know to do, then we're going to have a generation following us that doesn't understand simple things. Valerie, a few years ago, this is just the truth. Uh, we took a bunch of girls over to the house. These are not girls. These were young ladies. These were single ladies. These were teachers in our school, college graduates. I'm telling you the story. I lie not. College graduates. And we took them to the house, and everybody said, now listen, we're going to do some simple recipes, some things, just to give you some basic ways to, to cook easy food. And uh, as God is, I'm not making this up. If I'm lying, I'm dying. I'm not going to tell you her name, because you know her. But she's from Filipino descent, about this tall, her name's Antonella. Whom we love with all our hearts. Antonella? Boil water. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Valerie spoke Greek to her at that moment. Simple thing. And I could name the other girls over there. Simple things. I I was like, I know how to boil water. I know how to, uh, listen, macaroni and cheese, I got that. How many of you know who Mike Rowe is? Mike Rowe, he's the dirty jobs guy, okay? 
So Mike Rowe, I don't, I don't think Mike Rowe, I've looked, I, I don't think there's any testimony of faith. I, I think his mom and dad uh, may, may be religious, but I don't know about their testimony of faith. But I, I do love Mike Rowe because Mike Rowe teaches work ethic. I'm going to read you what a good man, probably not a saved man, but a good man has written and he gives out scholarships for men and women to go learn trade. Now this is a man that is not a pastor, not a Christian per se, but he says this, and I want you to see something that I, I'm going to bring it to a point in just a moment. Uh, number one, there's 12 things. Number one, I believe they have to, the, the people have to sign this to, to get his scholarship to get a trade, to get into trade school. I believe that I've won the greatest lottery of all time. I'm alive. I walk the earth. I live in America. Above all things, I am grateful. Number two, I believe that I am entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, nothing more. I understand that happiness and the pursuit of happiness are not the same thing. Number three, I believe there's no such thing as a bad job. I believe that all jobs are opportunities, and it's up to me to make the best of them. Number four. I do not follow my passion, I bring it with me. I believe that any job can be done with, the, with passion and enthusiasm. Number five, I deplore debt and do all I can to avoid it. I would rather live in a tent and eat beans and borrow money to pay for a lifestyle I cannot afford. Number six, I believe that my safety is, I believe that my, safety is my responsibility. I understand that being in compliance does not necessarily mean I'm out of danger. Number seven, I believe the best way to distinguish myself at work is to show up early, stay late, and cheerfully volunteer forever. And he uses a word we wouldn't use in church, crappy task. There, there is. I believe that the most annoying sounds in the world are whining and complaining. I will never take them. I will never make them. I, if I'm unhappy with my work, I will either find a new job or find a way to be happy. I believe that my education is my responsibility and absolutely critical to my success, I am resolved to learn as much as I can from whatever source is available to me. I will never stop learning and understand that library cards are free. I believe that I'm a product of my choices, not my circumstances. I will never blame anyone for my shortcomings or the challenges I face, and I will never accept the, uh, the credit for something I didn't do. Number 11, I understand the world is not fair, and I'm okay with that. I do not resent the success of others. Number 12, I believe that all people are created equal. I also believe that all people make choices. Some choose to be lazy. Some choose to sleep in. I choose to work my off. That's almost biblical. Take out a couple of words. You say, preacher, the school is going to educate my children. I, I don't think I trust that. Somebody, if somebody is going to do it, nobody's ever going to do it. We, we, we've got to get back to this thing of, hey, I can't send kids out in the world that are not prepared for life. Years ago, we had a young man we were trying to help, and uh, my wife went out on the limb and got him a job interview at her company. Good company, good job, good benefits. And he was staying with us for a few days before he went to the interview. This is a 21, 22-year-old man going to a corporate interview. He walked out of his room, Bermuda shorts, T-shirt, you know, flip-flops, whatever. My wife said, oh, no. Oh, no, no. You're not going to go use my name and show up like that. What's wrong? His mom and dad, somebody, had never explained First impressions tell the most of the story. Send him back in, put him on a pair of khaki pants, a shirt. And then I, and then I said, well, you know, I better kind of go over some things like walk in like he got some sense. Shake somebody's hand, stand up, look in the eye. I mean, just what we used to call home training. Craftsmanship. Number two, letter B. We've got to get back to teaching character. Character, now listen, this has been on me for about five, six months. Listen, character is this. It is not doing what I want to do. It is doing what I'm supposed to do. It's not doing the easy thing. It's doing the right thing. We, we are sliding through a generation of men and women with no character who do 
what they want to do above everything. Well, I don't want to go to school today. I won't go. I don't want to go to work today. I won't go. Listen, I don't want to go to work any day, but I go. Why? Because I'm a Christian and I'm a mature adult. I talked to the young people about this Friday night. Listen, it's not your age or stage in life. It's your decisions in life that make you a mature adult or not. I know some of you are 56 years old, still very immature because you make the easy decision, not the right decision. We've got to teach our children to make the right decision, not the easy decision. We've got to make the decision that they're supposed to make, not the one they want to make. Well, I want it. That's the flesh. The Bible teaches to deny our flesh. Number three, letter C. We must teach them craftsmanship, character. We've got to, we've got to teach communication. We've got to teach communication. Uh, I was going to write them all down, but I decided not to. But how many verses in Proverbs deal with the tongue? We live in a generation you can't rebuke. We live in a generation you can't correct. There was a time in America that the campus of a university was where you went for the idea and exchange of ideas. That's where you went for debate and discussion and philosophy. Now we have campuses that if you don't like what they're saying, you boycott, you burn the campus down. Because we don't want to hear a different idea. We don't want to hear a different point of view. Communication. By the way, marriage, number one problem in marriage is communication. Number one problem in business, communication. Number one problem in church, communication. Number one problem in life, communication. We don't learn how to handle communication. Communication is how life works. And if you can't figure out how to resolve in your marriage... I learned to talk and communicate. You're not going to have a long marriage or you're not going to have a happy marriage. Same is true with work. Same is true with life. Friendships. Work relationships. How to, how to say things kindly, correctly. Tone, tenor. We, we must learn how to use our words. We say that to a little one-year-old like, say this word. We, we, we're having to say that to 30-year-olds. Say this word. That's not how you say that. We must teach craftsmanship and character and communication. Conflict resolution. You say, I'm going to go through life with no problems. You're not going to go through life long at all without problems. People involved, there's friction. Where friction is, there's heat. Where heat is, there's fire. You have to learn to put out the fire and not create a bigger fire. It, how are kids learning to resolve conflicts now? Fight, protest, scream, yell. Most of all, all of this really boils back to this. We fail to teach Christ and his word. Everything I just mentioned from character down to conflict resolution is found right here. Everything I've, I, we, 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 we've been asked to do marriage conferences. And, and you're like, what do you say at marriage conferences? I just teach what the Bible says. To apply biblical principles in your home, in your life, in your ministry. Where does that come from? Knowing Christ and knowing his word. Bezalel was an unusual man. Get to heaven, you're going to meet all these cool characters. Bezalel was not the leader. Moses was the leader. Joshua was the leader. Aaron was the leader. Miriam was the leader. These were the people that were at the front of the pack. But it was Bezalel who God called by name. And he said, hey, I want you to do this. I've gifted you to do this. But now watch this, Bezalel. I want you to teach others to do this. Now, what are we talking about Bezalel building right now? What, is, what, is, what are we talking about Bezalel building right now? What's it called? The what? What was going to be built later? Temple. If Bezalel does not train the next generation and they don't train the next generation and so on and so forth, when David comes along to prepare and Solomon comes along to put it in practice, there would not be skilled craftsmen to do it. Bezalel had a responsibility just like Asaph did with the music, just like David did, just like you and I do. We must prepare the next generation. Why? Because there's something bigger coming. As cool as the tabernacle was, compared to the temple, it was nothing. 
The tabernacle was a movable temporary structure. The temple was where the Shekinah glory would come and stay in a permanent manner. And the beauty of that temple would blow away the tabernacles. But it had to be someone that prepared the next generations. Our school, our church, our families must be working, number one, fulfill God's will for our life, but to prepare the next generation to fulfill God's will for their life. Now, what's your gifts? What's your talents? What's your job? Say, well, God hadn't called me. Oh, yes, he has. By name. By name. By name. And for a specific purpose. You say, well, I got all these gifts and talents. If you're not using them for the Lord, you're not maximizing you're not reaching your fullest potential. So heads or eyes are closed. So heads or eyes are closed. Don't look around. I'm going to call you by name. And you don't have to answer me loudly. But I'm going to call you by name. Just like, and far more importantly, the Holy Spirit's calling you by name. So if I said, uh, Dale Davis, gifts and talents, abilities, what are you using them with? For the glory of God, who are you passing them on to? Dale Davis would need to give an answer to the Lord. If I said uh, <laughs> Teresa Alfiero because I picked on her so much. Teresa, what's your gifts and talents? What are you using them for the glory of God and who are you passing them on to? Who, who can do your job if you're not here? Who can do your job when you're gone? Richard Carroll probably knows more about horticulture than anybody ever been. Richard, what's your job? What's your talent? What's your gifts? What are you using for the glory of God? Who of us are you teaching to know how to do what you do when you're gone? Todd Brown. Jack Stanley. Carolyn. Hasina. Christina. So I can go all the way down the list. Gifts, talents, abilities, background, experience. Don't waste all of that. Use it for the glory of God and then pass it to someone. Teach them that they may teach others also. Find you a faithful man and say, I want to pour into your life. I want to pour into your life the things I've learned, the things that were given to me, I want to give to you. The things I'm doing for Christ, I want to show you how to do those same things things for Christ I'm talking to Alan Corright at the graduation we have, a, we have a little boy at our school named Landon I don't know Landon at all I met his mom Friday night but I sat on the front row of our play Landon was not the wizard he was not the scarecrow he was not the tin man he was not the cowardly lion Landon was the guy down behind the stage moving props, doing the fog machine, setting lights and, and I watched my wife and I just, just as good as the play was, tickled to death watching this young young man just, I mean just excel in this seemingly unimportant role I was talking to Alan Friday night, he said preacher, he said, I wish earlier in the year I'd have got Landon going more on building sets and pride. This kid is just sucking up all the stuff I give him. He is so much a blessing. Now, I'm telling you, there are young boys, and if you knew his story, you'd be amazed what God's done in his life. But there are boys like Landon, there are men and women all around you that they want someone to teach and mentor them. They might not even know how to articulate it. But you can do that job. So I'm going to ask you a question. God's called you. Are you serving? Are you doing what you can do? And are you teaching others also? Let's stand to our feet. Heads are eyes are closed. Ira, sing a song of invitation. God's speaking to you. God's speaking to your heart specifically. You need to use the altar. You step out. You come.